Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity podcast, episode 76. We are back. I think this is going out um, early February and um, we have a very special guest joining us, a returning guest joining us, who I will introduce you to in a minute. But first of all, if I introduce you to the usual hosts, we are back with a full uh, repertoire of hosts today uh, following the last show. So welcome, Mr. Peter Lamp from Bath. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. And I'm very excited about this because I missed the last one with this guy. Um, wow. It was my one day I've had to cancel sessions ever. So my one day off work in eight years because <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't get out of bed. I was that I was <laughs> it was weird. It was weird. And like I had to cancel everything. And then the next day I was OK. It was very oh. odd. OK, we well, yeah. are here now. So I'm is- good. That's my 100 percent record gone. I'm gutted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Paul Bassett in uh, Putney, London. How are you doing? Not bad. I'm, I'm basically, you remember the old 1980s uh, joysticks with auto fire? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit like that. I'm a bit like that with mute because I've got a screaming child in the background. So I'm just like <laughs> muting on and off, depending on the level of screaming. Uh, it's what happens when you've got a two year old. That's OK. Just keep yourself muted. And when you when you want to chime in, just um, unmute yourself. That's, I'm hoping uh, Zoom have come up with some new software that cuts out all extraneous noise, apart from my deep <laughs> and, and charismatic voice. OK. And uh, we first met uh, this guest back on episode 43. Um, so it's kind of probably middle of last year, I think. I'm just trying to kind of work out when that would be. Uh, we are episode 76 today. If you haven't listened to the original episode, uh, our guest today is uh, Mr. Dave Whitley, Iron Tamer. Um, Hello again, Dave. Hello. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. (laughs) Uh, So if you haven't listened to the original episode, go back. It's episode 43. It's called The Mental Side to Physical Strength. Okay. Um, And we've got Dave back on today. And we're going to talk about, we've got a couple of um, uh, kind of, I suppose, starter questions, if you like, or themes that we've, we've kind of discussed that we, we're going to talk about today. Um, also, uh, we mentioned at the end of the podcast last time, uh, the very, very sad passing of Bud Jeffries uh, recently, which just happened a few days ago when we were recording this. Uh, Dave was very close uh, friends with, with Bud. Uh, so we will be discussing a little bit about Bud today and, and, uh, and, and Dave will be sharing some stuff and and uh, intertwining that with what we talk about uh, today. Um, And also some other bits to do with Wim Hof uh, training, uh, which cold exposure, breathing, that sort of thing. But we're gonna kind of, like we normally do, we're gonna have a a kind of fairly free flowing conversation. We've got an idea where we may go, but we never quite know where we're gonna end up. So that's the way we like it here. Um, So welcome, uh, Dave, what's been going on with you since last time we, we spoke which was like i say probably between six months and nine months ago something like that yeah i think it was back toward the end of last summer um yeah uh what's been going on with me uh lots of fun stuff um i have a three-year-old son he's turned three since the last time that we spoke and um so i i understand what what you're saying about about having to hit the mute button once in a while i uh fortunately my office is in the basement of my house so he's upstairs blundering around i don't know if you can hear hear him stomping and carrying on, but, but he's doing stuff up there. Um, I'm getting a phone call. Let me decline the phone call. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. and, uh, just been working on the, um, working with my coaching clients online for superhuman you coaching. Um, I did a couple of shows since the last time we spoke, I did two shows in 2021. Um, and, uh, which, in 2020, I did none because the whole year got canceled for the, the obvious reasons, but uh, had fun doing that and just been working on those things. And um, then, of course, uh, the past five, six, what was they Thursday? The past six days have been pretty well consumed with uh, coming to grips with the term that I'm never going to be able to text or call my friend again, which is uh, mm-hmm. painful because he was a big part of my life. He was a, a no pun intended because he was a big man, too. But he. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 
Um, for anyone who doesn't know the whole story, back in I met Bud where it went in like 2005, I think, at, at a very early incarnation of a uh, maybe it's 2004, very early incarnation of the U.S. attempts at Gear Boy Sport before we found out that Russians were were had been doing it for years. Um, and Bud and I actually both competed in that same event, and both of us did pretty miserably because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Um, but um, I met him then, became friends with him, and interviewed him for a project that I was doing in 2006 or so, where this is before podcasts, I would do interviews and then mail out physical CDs to the people on the list. And I interviewed Bud. And through that, Bud said, uh, you know, somebody to get on the show is Dennis Rogers. So Bud introduced me to Dennis Rogers, effectively setting me with both feet eyes forward on the path of becoming the performing strongman that I am now. And um, his impact and influence on, um, on me personally and my career as a coach and as a performer and as a speaker and as an author um, cannot be underestimated. So um, greatly missing him these past few days. Yeah. Like I said, I, I think I said just before we came on air, it was so uh, strange that we, we were talking about, Bud just at the back end of last week and someone had approached us and said, you really got to get Bud on the podcast, you know, and, and we were just in the, at the stage of reaching out to him again and, and then heard, heard the news over the weekend. So, um, I mean, for those people in this, in, in, in we, we're going out in England, I know we have lots of listeners in, you know, Australia, America, Canada, all over, but um, how would you describe um, Bud and what, I know it's so difficult because he did so much as we were discussing before we came on, but how would you describe um Bud and what he did to someone who 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 didn't know him at the moment because I was speaking to a lady earlier I was training to a lady in her 60s and I said have you ever heard of Bud Jeffries and she said no and I sort of tried to kind of say you know what he was like from what I knew but how how would you describe uh Bud to someone who, who didn't know him and had never seen him on social media or any of his feats of strength I would say that he was awesomeness personified like, I mean, it, it really comes down to that because everything that he did, he did with such an amazing passion and so effectively. And he was such a creative thinker on everything that he did. I would simply say he was awesomeness personified. And then I would just pull up some videos of some of the silly things that he would do and show the person because I don't think I can adequately describe. I mean, like, like how do you how do you adequately describe a 300 pound man? standing in a one-arm handstand driving a nail through a board and popping a balloon and then uh doing a shot of whiskey right after that i mean it's it's uh, I, I posted a photo on my personal facebook of him um that i think sums the whole thing up it's him wearing nothing but a kilt and a tie holding a cup of coffee juggling a kettlebell that's on fire yeah i saw that i saw yeah, it that's, yeah it was <laughs> And I think you That's said fun. something like, I think there was something that said something, you may be awesome, but you'll never be, you know, bud dressed like this, yeah. doing this awesome, you know. It was, yeah. Yeah. It's like a meme for like what it's like to take a child to school, you know, you've got your <laughs> cup of coffee, everything's going wrong, you're trying to hold it together, you know. What, what I liked as well, like you see, he was a 300 pound man, but he'd, he'd stand there with his, like holding his toes with his hands on one leg with his leg up here, wouldn't he as well, kind of, because yeah. he was really flexible as well. So he just he just broke all the he just broke the mold, didn't he? Everything yeah. was completely mm. just outrageous. Mm. Yeah, he he coined the term several years ago of being Gazellosaurus Rex. He wanted to be <laughs> as powerful as a T Rex and as as um uh what's the right word uh kind of graceful and yeah and yeah as graceful as a gazelle, and he was mm. those things. I think yeah. I saw Paul, Paul McElroy posted something about him and he said Pavel had called him the, the, the bumblebee of, mm -hmm. of strength or something like that because he just defied all physics. Because yep. <laughs> bumblebees yep. aren't meant to fly, meant to be able to fly, are they? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Very amazing. Yeah. So, um, so, Dave, in terms of uh, some of the things that we've been discussing on the podcast recently um, and things that, you know, when we, when we reconnected with you, you know, in, in the last few weeks and, and we arranged for you to come back on, um, I'd kind of said that there was a few things that we, we've been discussing and members and clients have been discussing with us and that you might be able to kind of shed your, uh, you know, your perspective and your wisdom uh, on. Um, 
and and we can tie that in and go in any direction we we, we want with it um so things like setting goals and targets that are linked to your own personal values beliefs and priorities as opposed to following the crowd or aiming for things that you feel should be moving towards based on your friends your family social media pressures because what i find i know it's a challenge for me and it's a challenge for lots of people that i speak to is that when they are on this kind of you know you mentioned tiktok and instagram and these things you constantly see people this person's really strong this person's really fit this person's really lean this person's really skillful this person's really agile and people kind of i know dan john calls it you know the art of keeping the goal the goal um you can kind of feel that you're being pulled in many different directions, but but how do you actually choose something that, that deeply identifies with you and that is meaningful to you as well. And not just, you know, following the crowd and trying to do things for maybe purposes that aren't true to your identity. I mean, I know it's a big question. It's a huge thing to, uh, you know, but uh, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I can I can go off uh, go for a while on this, and I think um, and, and I'm, I'm I'm really glad that this is one of the questions that we're talking about, and it's it's very appropriate because um, Bud was a master of this. If we're you know going to reference back to Bud Jeffries, he was absolutely a master of not giving a bleep. You about can swear. He, you can you can swear on here if you want. Whatever you like. Okay, I just want to make <laughs> want to make sure it wasn't one of those kind of places that you're not supposed to say fuck in front of the KIDS. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the Bud just, he, he, he did his thing and that's the thing that he did. And he was a true master of that. And, um, if you look at him and you're, you're unaware, if you're like going by the, the Instagram filter of what fitness should be, Bud didn't have a six pack. He didn't have, you know, a, a, a perfectly quaffed beard and, and, you know, stylish clothes and all of that kind of stuff when he was doing the thing. So, um, but that was by design. That was Bud being who he was. He did not want to be that kind of person. He understood where he was coming from and he understood what he wanted to be, which was to be at an exceptionally high level at a number of different things, which we're very often told not only not to attempt to do, but that it's not possible. It's not possible for someone to, um, you know, swing a 24 kilo kettlebell for a thousand reps and then go press 150 pound or 100, yeah, 150 pound kettlebell overhead immediately after and then drop into the splits. But a guy like Bud could do that. And mm-hmm. so that kind of inspiration is something that um, I took to heart very early on in my association with him and a few other strong men who think the same way. Um, and because of that, it was, it's always been um, pretty pretty easy for me to navigate back to what is my true purpose in all this stuff. And that's what it comes down to is what is your purpose in setting the goal in the first place? Mm -hmm. If you say something like, Oh, I want to get in great shape. That doesn't mean anything. It's like saying, um, I want to, I want to travel or I want to have a lot of money. It's just, it's a, it's a concept. It's an idea, but it doesn't really mean anything. Um, specific until the individual gets specific with it. So, um, if you're going to set a goal that is linked to your personal priorities and your personal values and, and your personal beliefs, the obvious first step is to define what your values and beliefs and priorities are. And I think that that is um, the big place that it's very easy to get tripped up before you even, um, you know, before you even suit up to go out on the field to play the game, you have to have that in place. Otherwise you're going out ill prepared where, want to go what are your priorities what are your beliefs what are your values and i encourage people to actually sit down and write out this is what i believe and um if i'm working with you in a coaching situation like that then i will break things down into categories like family or health and or health and fitness and and finances and career and impact on the world all that kind of stuff and if we start listing those things out that's awesome now we can start to see um what do I really believe versus what do I think I'm supposed to believe? Mm. Because if I write down something and it doesn't resonate with me, then it's not really my belief. It's something that someone has told me I should believe, or it's something that I feel like I should live up to based on my interaction with the rest of the world, either in person in 3d or via social media or whatever. Right. Mm. And so getting clear on what it really means, what's really important is huge. What I encourage people to do if they're, tripped up on that is list out all of the stuff that you don't want 
Mm. Because how often um, any fitness professionals that, that are in the, in the crowd of listeners that we're talking to, how often does someone come in and you say, okay, what do you want to accomplish in here? Well, I don't want to be fat anymore. I don't want to be weak anymore. I don't want to have pain in my joints when I move anymore. I don't want to keep eating this way. You've just listed off a bunch of stuff that you don't want. You haven't told me anything that you do want, except you kind of have. Because what you don't want reveals to me what you do want. But if you're so wrapped up in these are the things that I don't want, these are the things that I want to change, I can't stand living with these things in my life anymore. That's a good insight, but it's not any direction. It's, it's not taking any active direction to get away from it. You understand what I mean? Because Yeah. I mean, I used to work with people who were, you know, you, I mean, I'm sure we've all worked with middle managers or people who, you know, play a role in a project or something like that and their sole goal seems to be being being able to say no to something rather than contributing you know mm. some kind of active kind of direction to the project or you know whatever you're doing and and that's not really they think it's taking charge of things but it's not right right um so through first of all listing out things that we don't want um we can determine what we do on I, I actually have a very involved um process that I do with my coaching clients where we list these things out and then we take the thing that you say you don't want and on another piece of paper rewrite it 180 degrees from what it actually from, from where you're starting right hmm. um so let's say for example um we're talking about money right um I don't want to be broke anymore okay great all of your attention's going on being broke what do you think you're going to get because whatever you plant and water in your mind is what you're going to get more of so if you're just continually watering this worry about finances then you're going to grow more lack of finances if that makes sense hmm. so we re we rewrite that that's a tough one for me to say we rewrite that <laughs> and, um, i don't know if you remember I, the when i was a kid i had that stutter so there it is um and that kid's still in me but i just don't let him run the show anymore i just tell him it's okay i got this hmm. um rewrite it as it's polar opposite so what would i don't want to be broke anymore it would be i want to be wealthy or i want to have more than enough money to to do anything that i want to do and those are good broad concepts and then from there we can start to get more specific about it because having plenty of money means two completely different things to two different people right to be uh to to put it in context with some sort of a physical culture or, or training aspect to get in shape or to be stronger or or any of those kinds of things you know the average person who's never done anything that means something very different to them than it does someone like bud jeffries who mm -hmm. was high level at all of those things mm -hmm. you know so um, that's the first thing is figuring out exactly what you want. And then we can look at that list and we can look at what are our personal values and what are our personal beliefs? Well, if you haven't written those down, then you don't know what they are really. You kind of have an idea, but it's kind of like, um, it's, it's kind of like not reconciling your checkbook every month and then wondering why you're broke mm. because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know where your money's going. You know, same sort of thing um, on a much more amplified scale with your belief system. If you believe, okay, I really want to be strong and get in shape, but then the other side is I really don't want to work hard and I hate going to the gym and I love eating junk food and I hate eating healthy foods, the belief will win over the desire every single time because the belief acts as a, um, a guidance system, like a GPS or an automatic pilot on an airplane. And if, if you go off course consciously, willfully, and attempt to willpower your way to a destination that is not programmed in to your autopilot or your GPS, you will continually get rerouted as soon as you take your attention off of this concentrated, focused exercise of, of will. And will is a finite resource. You can only operate at maximum willpower toward a given end at any given time. Um, or, or, or for a for a given time, I, I kind of tripped over the words, but you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. You can't sustain that. So eventually, your beliefs and your self image, your self concept, are going to take the reins back over and guide you back to where you came from. Case in point, um, we've talked about finances and we've talked about um, um, physical training. 
um, let's use weight loss as a specific example on that. How many people do we know as um, from being in the fitness business who have gained and lost the same 10 or 20 kilos multiple times? Mm-hmm. Or they come in and they, they lose 10 or 15 kilos. And then a year later, they're 30 kilos heavier than they were when they started, right? Their self image is not that of a person who is healthy and at that weight and doing well. Their self image is that of the person who is overweight and out of shape and at risk for all of the stuff that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. Finance is the same way. Um, um, every few years here in the States, there's a story that'll pop up of someone who lives in a very low income area who's pretty well impoverished that'll win a lottery of several million dollars. And then a year later, they're in worse position than they were financially before they won the lottery. What's going on with that? Their self-image, their belief system is rooted in lack of deserving money and rooted in poverty and rooted in the old um, money is evil kind of stuff, right? And mm-hmm. so if you if you want to be a good person and you want to be rich, and, but you also believe that money is evil, you'll find a way to mess that up for yourself. So what I like to do is take those things and um, figure out how we can reprogram the belief system to match up with the goal. Mm -hmm. And so if the goal is an indication of where we want to be, and we have a belief system that's in conflict with that, we must address that belief system first. And we do that not by convincing ourselves that we are different than we believe ourselves to be through force, but rather by imagining ourselves to be the person that we want to be over and over and over again to impress it on the subconscious until the subconscious, which doesn't know the difference between something that's happening in a 3D world and something that's vividly imagined, eventually accepts it as, oh, okay, these are the new coordinates for my um, yeah. my final destination. We'll start acting accordingly. Hmm. How long does that take? I mean, I know this is a this is a broad another broad question, but if you were going to try to to uh, convince your your belief system and uh, th- that you th- this vision of yourself as something different than you are currently, um, and then you were going to start taking actions towards becoming that person, and, and you know you you like you say without just relying on willpower alone, because you are actually driving towards that thing. It, is that a process that can happen quickly or is this a process of convincing the belief system it's all it's almost in tangent it sounds like i know you 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 know paul mcelroy and things you know this kind of expanding the comfort zone and expand you know gradually convincing the central nervous system to allow you to be stronger you know Mm -hmm. is it Mm -hmm. kind of similar to that kind of thing it's absolutely similar to that it's um um the 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 first step of believing something that goes against what you currently believe is to be made aware of it. Mm. The next step is to um, believe that it's possible for someone else to do it or believe that it's possible for it to be done. And then the next step after that is understanding how to convince yourself that not only is it possible and not only can someone else do it, but I could do it too. Mm. Once you start to, to, to do that, you put a little crack in that faulty belief system And uh, you will start looking for ways to to express that and not like consciously looking for it. You'll be compelled to do it. That's Mm -hmm. the that's the big thing Um, to use the fitness example. The person who says, I hate going to the gym. I love eating junk food and, you know, all of the things that are associated with that. They can force themselves to go through a 12 week or 16 week transformation process and get very good results out of it. And then at the end of it no real change occurs and they lapse back into whatever they were doing before that, that puts them back in the same position. The, the other way that that works is the person um, goes through that transformational process because they flipped a switch in their mind at the beginning. This is who I'm going to become. And that's who I am now. And my body just has to catch up with me. And then, of course, the third way of doing that is the person who's not convinced starts the program and somewhere along the way, the program and their ability to to get up every day and go do the thing and eat the foods and all that sort of stuff convinces them, hey, I'm actually able to do this. This is who I'm becoming. I like this person. So those are really the the three different Hmm. possibilities there. So you got a two out of three chance of winning, really. (laughs) I love love that because there's a a quote that um, 
uh, one of my ex-coaches used to use. And I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it was how a belief is a, is a thought that your behavior conforms to. I don't know if thought's the right word, but your no matter what you want or you think you want, your behavior conforms to that specific right. thing, doesn't it? So like you say, you believe you don't want to go to the, you, don't, you, you hate the gym and you want to eat junk food, but you're going to get in shape. If that's your belief, you're going to conform to that anyway. Your behavior is going to make you not want to go to the gym and, and not be that person. So that's yep. why, you know, I, I, I like to think of the job as, of, of coaches is to make that person, like you say, change their belief system. Well, not, not change their belief system, make them believe what they, um, what they want can be achievable. So it's kind of like trying to make somebody enjoy the process, isn't it? If, Absolutely. if you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah. and the way the way that I articulate that very thought is my job as a coach or as a mentor, as a guide, whatever you want to call it, is uh, there's there's many aspects to it. But at the root of it, one of the primary things is for me to give you permission to succeed. And that's that's not something that I came up with. That was a, a client that I trained or worked with um, several years ago. She had gone to very various different places for physical stuff and also for, for mental stuff. She'd done like traditional therapy and all that. And the reason that everything worked when she worked with me wasn't because I'm so great, um, but it was because my approach as a coach wasn't to try to um, shame her into improving. It was mm. I encouraged her to the point that, that she gave herself permission to get better. She stopped comparing herself to all these external things and just decided, you know, what what kind of house do I want to build and built that house rather than looking at everybody else's houses and thinking, well, they've got three bathrooms and they've got two and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know what to do. Um, I've had an exact same situation with a client recently. It's been quite an amazing thing to watch. About six months ago, I sat down with this individual and she was she was almost kind of like just telling me, look, Paul, you're going to take me on. And I'm going to do exactly what I always do. I'm going to I'm going to negotiate with you in sessions, and sometimes I'm just going to refuse to do the work. And this is what I've done with other clients. But there was something about her which was I could tell she was quite fun, and I knew that she was just trying to put me off. So in the end, I said, "Look, just sign up. We'll do it. Give it a go. I guarantee the program. You can't lose." And uh, she signed up. It's funny because she started to initially went into that kind of that way of thinking but then I just I didn't I didn't kind of spend too much time on it I just said look if you want to lift heavy or light or whatever you want to do just try your best and I just took a bit of pressure off her shoulders and as you said I like that word permission she suddenly started seeing I've got gives gave herself permission to start being the person she wants to be the funny thing is now like I got a phone call just before Christmas saying she went from two, twice a week to signing up for the amazing 12, five days a week at 6 a.m. And she said she'd never <laughs> want to train in the morning and she was always training in the evening. And here she is doing 6 a.m. every day for the next three months. She starts next week. So it's going to be exciting. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's really obvious when the switch flips on somebody because they stop acting like the person that you knew and start acting like this new person that they want to be. And they're not even aware of it in, in a lot of cases. So that's amazing. Mm. Um, I've I've had I've had recently as well. There was a lady lady who comes to me, who um, you know, she was having a little bit of trouble, like one one side on her lower back, and she, you know, so I gave her some stuff to do, at home, just simple stuff, which I like to give to people, just like stand against the wall and lift your leg up, and that'll sure. get rid of it. And then, so she turns up four days later. Have you been doing that? Yeah. How does your back feel? Uh, it's still a bit sore and all that. Is it better than it was Monday? Oh, yeah, it's way better than it was Monday. I'm like, why do you start with the, with the, how it feels now? Why don't you start with the, actually, it's improved? Because then, you know, if you're doing something and it's working, carry on doing it. If it's not working, let's, let's take a different approach, you know? So it's, it's, yeah. I think that's, that's, that, that's a tendency for when for when you start something that you think you're not you're not able to achieve you start looking for the negatives don't you rather than saying right what's improved today what's improved this week what's improved since yesterday absolutely um, you know and those Why are the small that is that, i was about to say dave i'd be interested in your insight into with clients and i'm I'm and i think people just in general whether it's in work work contexts it would probably be the same which is 
people start talking about like I've been bad, I've been this, and I and I wonder what the processing is that brings out that kind of language, particularly in health. I don't know if you've how you approach that kind of thing because like like Peter says that often people will start with this negative perspective on any action in terms of their health, their diet, their exercise. I'm not strong enough. This side is weak. I've been bad. I've eaten wrong foods, bad foods. I mean, what, what's your take on, on that kind of language and that perspective? Well, ultimately, it comes down to the um, mental conditioning and the mental programming that each of us carries around. We, from birth until about age six or seven, our mind, our brain, the, the physical organ of our brain, not just our mind, because our mind is not our brain. A lot of, a lot of us will think, when I say the word mind, we'll get an image of the brain, but the brain is not the mind, because when you die, your brain remains, but you and your mind exit the physical structure, right? So, um, but the brain itself is the interface between... Um, the body that I'm walking around in and the thoughts that I have that are floating around out there wherever they are, right? And so from birth until about six or seven years old, our brains operate primarily in a theta brainwave state, which is um, in adults, it's that same state, like right before you fall asleep, but you're still awake enough to be aware of what's going on. You haven't drifted off into dreamland. You feel like you could move your body, but you also feel like you're not in your body anymore. I mean, we, we've all experienced that, that half asleep thing. That's the goal of meditation. That's the goal of hypnosis is to get into that state so that we can, um, um, strip away the superfluous external stuff and like really get in touch with who we truly are. Um, so um, part of the wonder of the theta brainwave state is the ability to um, learn at a rapid rate. And by learning, I mean um, impressing thoughts and concepts and ideas and facts onto the subconscious mind. So when we're very young, we're in that state almost all the time. Um, anyone with young children, please pay attention to this because this is kind of, uh, um, my son just turned three a couple of months ago and this has started to, like everywhere I look, this is landing in my lap more often and more often about how to, um, how to raise an exceptional child. Well, you must become an exceptional parent. And the way to become an exceptional parent is to break the cycle of all of the stuff that you can possibly do that was programmed into you that doesn't serve you and will not serve your child. Um, and you know, it, we can get angry at our parents and our relatives and our school teachers and our friends who implanted these ideas into us when we were little kids, um, all we want to, but it doesn't change anything until we change something ourselves. We must understand that the people who programmed us when we were little did the best they could with the level of awareness and understanding of the world and themselves at the time. And if it messed us up, we have to let that go. Otherwise, we're carrying it around. Um, and sometimes we carry around things that are to our detriment that were very much for our survival at one point. I tell a story sometimes about an egg, you know, a bird's egg, while the embryo is developing in the fertilized egg, keeps that embryo alive and allows it to develop until it hatches out. It's very important. And if, if you crack that egg open, that shell too soon, the developing embryo or baby bird will die. But if the bird hatches out of that egg and then insists on carrying that egg around with it for the rest of its life, because it protected me once I need it. It's my survival thing. Um, you're at, and the bird's actually dragging it around. It will wind up being much more likely to get eaten by a predator because it can't fly as easily or it, 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 it won't let go of the thing that kept it alive at one point. And we as humans are a lot like that, but in a much deeper way with our um, belief systems, our coping skills, with the way that we talk to each other or in the way that we talk to ourselves, um, we all carry around concepts and ideas in our belief systems that not only don't serve us, but work directly against us. The first step is becoming aware of that fact. The next step is identifying and then reprogramming them. And um, I refer to that, that entire um, uh, glob of information as a mental diet. If we look at physical nutrition, um, we have 
uh, let's say that, that we, we, we decide we want to look or perform in a particular way based on our physical training, right? Um, or, or lack of physical training, you know, some, some people don't want to train, they just want to change the way they eat and lose weight. That's fine. That's great. Um, but let's say that you're, you know, looking to make weight and get in shape for some sort of a competition, right? There's a couple of different approaches you can take nutritionally with that. You can just you feel like eating at any given time and hope for the best, or you can structure what you're consuming so that it lines up with the end result that you want to achieve and that your nutrition supports you and your nutrition does its job to fuel you for your training. Now, obviously, which one of those things is going to work better, just haphazardly eating whatever or consuming, planning, consuming and tracking and, and, and doing all that with your food. Obviously, the high level performers are going to keep track of what they're doing. Our mental diet is no different. We can approach that from the standpoint of our mental diet is everything that we allow into our mind from the outside and also everything that we permit to dwell in our mind that we create ourselves internally. If we were going to compare that to our physical diet, our physical diet, um, external information coming into our mind is like going to a restaurant. You know, you can go and you can order the food and you can be, someone else prepares it for you and you, you just eat it and you have a pretty good idea of what ingredients are being used, but you're not a hundred percent sure. Right. Um, and then the, um, internal aspect of a mental diet is what thoughts am I originating? What am I um, looking at ideas and then valuing those ideas in such a way that they become a part of my belief system that I accept this and I consent to this thought? You know, we can, we can consent or consent to or reject any thought that comes to us whether it's from external or internal. So if we really want to get our mind the way we want it to be, first we have to define how we want it to be, and then we have to identify what is in our mind currently that we don't want to be there, and we replace it. Um, and it's a, the, the trip up that a lot of people have is, well, that's just positive thinking, and look at the circumstances around me um, my life has all of this stuff going on that I, that, you know, these are facts, right? But those facts are there because you've consented to thought processes that put you in that position, right? Um, and your clients you were talking about earlier, she had consented to, uh, I'm an argumentative, troublesome client, and this is how I'm going to act when we get there. Okay, but, but you did the perfect thing. You didn't feed that. You just said, well, come on in and let's see how it goes. And in the process of seeing how it goes, you showed her that that's not, that's not how she has to be. And she picked up on it for herself. Um, you cannot force another person to change their mind that way. They have to be ready to make the change themselves. And so if we look at this mental diet, if we look at the um, how we should be based on what our friends are telling us, but that's not who we want to be, then let all that other stuff go and construct who you want to be and, and build on it from there. Um, the the beauty of the theta brainwave thing that I was talking about earlier is like, if you take a child who's very young and they grow up in a family of, of people who speak say four different languages, they will grow up effortlessly speaking all four languages as long as they're exposed to it. Now you take someone like any one of us four. Um, I don't know if any, any of you guys are multilingual. I am not. And say, okay, we're going to, we're going to go and we're going to learn at the same time how to speak Spanish Russian and French go do it all at the same time. You've got a year to get fluent at this. That's going to be a full-time job, right? Because our brains are not in theta absorbing that information the same way it is when we're a child. So um, knowing that that phenomenon exists in the physical realm is awesome. Knowing that as we fall asleep and as we wake up, we pass that state is awesome because that gives an opportunity to literally go back to the child mind and um, instead of just letting our thoughts drift or instead of dwelling on whatever horrible thing happened today um, or whatever terrible thing we're anticipating happening tomorrow if we construct a vivid scene of what we want to accomplish and who we want to be and we run that scene as we're falling asleep we start to reprogram the subconscious mind that way and it becomes very, very easy and very, very powerful. I've got a question for you. This was in Matthew Walker's book, How, uh, Why We Sleep. And 
if yeah, which, if I, you, which I have not read. So okay, if if it, I think he talks about this similar concept, and I'm going to ask you a specific question in a minute because I know you play guitar. Um, he he was saying you you if you're trying to learn something or remember something, you can you can use that. So you know when you you know when you're trying to do something throughout a day and it just frustrates you, but you you leave it, you sleep on it, and then the next day it might become easier because. Mm -hmm. If that is on your mind while you go to sleep, say, it'll go through your mind. You're trying to learn a process, say, and it'll go through your mind throughout the day really slowly. But when you're asleep, it'll go like, brruh, 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 and it just goes through and through and through and through. So if you're trying to learn um, a, a song, say, on guitar, and I've done this because I, I play bass, and you go to bed and you're going over it and over it and over it in your head, and then you try again the next day, it's, it's so, it, it, more often than not, it's easier the next day than it was the day before when you were when you were trying to remember it and i think that's the same thing i think that's what you're explaining is is you go over this stuff over and over over in your head while you're asleep and it just becomes part of you sure yeah and and, and you're talking about practicing a physical skill when you do that and it's very effective for that um it is also very effective for non-physical things like um um believing that you're the kind of person who is worthy of love, you know, like, yeah. like what a horrible thing to think, you know, that, that you're not worthy of love. If you can convince, you don't even have to convince yourself of it. If you can create a, an imaginal scene that implies that and then fall asleep in that scene, your outlook on those things will change. It's interesting that you bring up um, playing music as well, too, because um, anyone who, uh, plays a uh, guitar or bass or anything like that, especially if you're, you know, understand or a fan of rock music is probably aware of a guitar player from the States named Steve Vai. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Vai? He played with, uh, David Lee Roth. he played with David Lee Roth in the eighties. He played with White Snake in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. He's been a solo artist, played with Frank Zappa. He is an yeah. absolute high level genius. He's literally, and, 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 and I'm, I'm just putting this together right now. He, he's one of those guys, he's like to the guitar, what Bud Jeffries was to physical stuff. Like yeah. he can do everything. Right. My brother had one of the seven string Ibanez universes yeah. with the, uh, the little handle, you know? Yeah. I, um, I watched uh, an interview with him a while back and was just blown away by him saying this. He was, he, he was talking about technique and note selection and that kind of stuff a little bit, but then he started talking about being more expressive with the instrument. And the part that I took away from it is he said, if you can close your eyes and imagine yourself playing something that is beyond your current capabilities, but you can see it. Like you look down at your hands and you see your fingers on the fretboard or you see the pick in your hand. And if you can imagine yourself playing it gracefully, and perfectly and fully expressing yourself with it, then you're practicing better that way a lot of times than you are with your hands physically on the instrument. And I'm like, that's exactly what all of these other guys that, that are in all these other areas are talking about. So he he's literally doing imaginal practice. And there's, there's um, what was the study that Judd, um, I can't remember his, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, DeSoto, De, I forget what his, um, how to pronounce his last name, but he was, he wrote a book called, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on that one too. Anyway, <laughs> it, it refer, I'm, I'm referencing the study with the, um, the control group was uh, the basketball study. Oh you yeah. Had, yeah. You had, you had three groups. You had um, people that didn't shoot baskets. You had people that practice shooting baskets for 20 minutes a day or something like that. And then you had people who um, didn't physically shoot, but they imagine themselves sinking baskets and the improvement rate between the physical practitioners and the imaginal practitioners was almost the same percentage wise. It was like 23% versus 20% improvement, something like that. That's mm. powerful stuff. And mm. the real thing to understand is there is no off switch to this, whatever mm. we are allowing into our mind whatever we consent to that we, that we feel strongly about is getting impressed. And our loop that we get stuck in is we do things that reflect what we believe to be true and get more of the same result. And we're like, see, there it is. There it is. This yeah. is, these are facts, but we can, we can change that. I'm trying to do, it's I'm trying to work on, or I'm working on at the moment in uh, one arm press ups for this, um, for this course. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, working on the progressions and trying to get stronger. And sometimes I, I, I have a, I dream at night and I have a, I have a dream Wee. that I can go down 
and I can just do them really, really well, you know. And then you, and then you wake up the next day and you kind of think, did I dream that, or or can I do that, or can I? You, you seem, you like you say, the dreams seem so vividly real that mm-hmm. you, because I'm in the same environment doing it, but I just go there and I can and I can do it. And I wonder if that's actually. I've not I had the opposite kind of dreams. When I, <laughs> <laughs> particularly, right, the, between the ages of about 17 and 23, I hadn't driven a car in about five, well, yeah, six years. And then I had to get on, and then uh, I was managing this band, and then they just bought this van that was like 100 quid, it's an old Mercedes van. And they said, well, you're the manager now, you've got to drive this, and I hadn't driven. But for six years previously, I had this recurring nightmare that every time I got in a car, that I would just get in there and I would be unable to control it in any way, but have my foot properly on the accelerator. And so I would just zoom off all the way around. So that was what I was going through my head when I got into this kind of <laughs> two ton Mercedes van that's about 40 years old. Uh, eventually I did get the hang of it, but I did hit, I did, I did, I did hit a few things on the, on the way before I got good at it. <laughs> Anyway, um, Dave, I was going to say, we, we, I'm not actually going to start, I don't think, at the moment, because it's, 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 we're coming up to the end of our time, and I don't want to, I've mentioned um, Wim Hof beforehand, but I think it would be, it would do it a disservice, actually, to, to start with only a few minutes left. Um, I mean, we can talk, we can tell, uh, I'm not sure, I think probably, yeah, I think maybe if we, sometime in the future, we can get you on and actually do a proper discussion about you know Wim Hof and the Wim Hof system and your your history with it and I know you were one of the first people you know to get certainly um in America to go through the kind of training for the for the Wim Hof system uh-huh. um but I think I, I think probably to try and just kind of shoehorn something into five minutes wouldn't really do it uh do it justice or, or what it we're gonna have a go can you we explain can get, can... <laughs> Wim Hof life work in five minutes no <laughs> I can, no i don't I know an, i can give you an overview of it and i can also yeah, if you, yeah, if you could give us an overview that would be brilliant and we'll and we'll maybe maybe talk in depth for another time but so sure. so i know you've got um i well you can explain because i know that you you did the wim hof training a few a number of years ago and one of the first people to take to, to get on board certainly in the states and and you've got some workshops coming up and things so sure. yeah do you want to tell us a little bit about um your experience with wim hof and what it is Sure. Um, I'll start with the workshop thing. Um, February 5th and 6th in Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown, um, myself and another Wim Hof Method instructor named Jesse Coomer, who got certified at the same event that I got certified at. So we're both in that group, the first 27 or 28 people in the States to get certified, which was a phenomenal experience. Uh, We're going to be teaching two-day workshop. Day one is fundamentals. Day two is advanced. We're going to be covering the the three pillars of the Wim Hof method, which are cold exposure, breathing, and um, mindset, commitment, mental focus stuff. Um, The, those three points to Wim Hof are, um, uh, that's, that's the core essence of it. And, and um, for the uninitiated, you see, Wim or you see one of the instructors um and if you don't know about Wim Hof I I could go on and on about the man himself and his feats he is amazing just google him and go find the videos on YouTube of him swimming amongst glaciers um it's gorgeously shot I think it was actually on a BBC show but I may be wrong uh you know it's like way up north glaciers around him swimming in that water and talking about um I don't feel the cold I feel the power Mm. which is you know kind of sums it all up um if the uninitiated person sees that or sees someone like myself or Jesse or another instructor or someone who's just really into it, doing some of the silly stuff that we do, I posted stuff on uh, uh, social media a couple of weeks ago when we got one of our rare Tennessee snowfalls of myself and my son sled riding down a hill. I'm wearing shorts. He's all bundled up. And um, it's funny because I, my wife posted it on her stuff and got multiple comments about how I was going to get hypothermia. I was going to get frostbite. I was going to get sick and die, all this kind of stuff. And like, you're completely missing the point. The reason cold exposure is so powerful and heat exposure too, is because as civilized beings, we have evolved into a place, you know, use it or lose it kind of thing that the vast majority of our time, um, I don't do m- uh, Celsius conversions very well for my European friends. So I'm going to speak in Fahrenheit here. Um, very rarely do we go below 67 degrees Fahrenheit or above 72, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's that narrow little window that we exist in and our ability to, um, 
to withstand that and thrive in that is much like an unused muscle for someone who's sitting on the couch and never done any strength training. They could become phenomenally stronger than they are, but it's going to take some exposure to a specific stimulus. The stimulus in this case being cold. Um, the more cold exposure we can um, uh, acclimate our bodies to, the better an effect it has on our system overall. Um, it helps us to uh, all of these things work in conjunction to do this, but it helps us to boost the immune system, which in this day and age, who isn't interested in having a strong immune system, right? Mm -hmm. With everything that's going on in the world. Um, so the cold exposure, that is the main reason for it. And when I see people who come in and like, raw cold exposure, I'm hard, blah, I'm not, you're going to die if you do that. That's the thing about it. Like if you go to the gym and you like try to push yourself past your limits and all of that kind of silly stuff, um, you might get hurt in the gym. You might, you know, pull a muscle or tweak a tendon or, or whatever. If you do that with the cold, you'll die. Mm. Pure and simple. You, it can kill you. Very rarely does anybody die in the gym from going too hard, but mm. someone stays in the cold a little bit too long. And the trick about it is once you're, once you're in it and it gets in you, that's what Wim says is get in it and then get out of it before it gets in you. Um, it starts to, you don't feel cold anymore. You start to feel just kind of relaxed and euphoric and I'm just going to lay down and take a nap. And that's how people die from hypothermia, right? Mm. So the cold training aspect is critical for Wim Hof, but I do it in a very, um, logical, systematic, individualized, progressive way. The other uh, pillar that involves physical activity is the breath work. And the cool thing about the Wim Hof breath work is that it cuts away so much of the esoteric and um, woo-woo stuff because Wim, having done this himself for decades, thought, I want to set all of the spiritual woo-woo stuff aside and just let science take a hard science look at what's going on physiologically. And what he found out was that the breathing exercises change the body's pH from alkaline or from acidic to alkaline. And the a tremendous amount of the diseases and problems that we have as a result of modern society just simply can't thrive or even exist in some cases in a highly alkaline environment. So we can literally consciously boost our immune system through breathing and through focusing our mind. And of course, the mindset um, aspect of all that is the ability to be truly disciplined. What do I mean by discipline? Discipline doesn't mean beating the shit out of yourself. Discipline is simply, I give myself an order, and then I follow that order. And so if I give myself an order that I'm going to do a round of Wim Hof breathing that involves taking 30 deep breaths that look like this, well, it doesn't seem like much, but when you get to about 14 or 15, you start to get a little bit tired and you start to get a little bit like, ah, I'm close enough, I'll go ahead and stop. But if you made the commitment to yourself to get to 30, follow through on that commitment. And the cool thing about it, each time you do that with something that is as simple and easy to perform as breathing, you give yourself a little win check mark. You give yourself um, a reminder that you accomplished something that you wanted to give up on or that you wanted to stop. And so every breathing session can become that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the effects that that has on a person's psyche is incredible. Another thing that I am um, experimenting with a lot right now, and I don't really have any hard science to back this up, but I'm not a hard science guy. I am a, this is my experience let's see if you had the same experience guy. And I don't care what science says. Again, um, um, salute to Bud Jeffries for the whole bumblebee attitude, right? Mm. <laughs> I'm, I want to do this. You can't do that. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Let's wait until after I've given an attempt. You know, don't, don't be that person who, who says that you can't do that to the, to the other person who's already doing it, right? Mm. Um, the thing that, that I'm very interested in in terms of breath work in general, but since Wim Hof is, is such a, a fast track way to get to these altered mental states that you can have is the effect that the breath work has on our brainwaves. Because what I'm finding is, um, again, I don't have hard science to back this up, but what I'm finding is based on my own experience and the way that I'm feeling when I'm doing this stuff, that, that the feeling of being in that theta state is something that I experience when I'm doing the breath work. So logically, if I can access theta brainwave state, through breathing exercises as part of meditation, hypnosis, or whatever, can I breathe my way into that state that the clutter is out of the way? 
subconscious is there, I can take the idea that I want to impress and just impress it and not have all the all the other bullshit getting in the way, not trying to not having my conscious mind and my ego trying to talk me out of it or telling me that it's something that can't be done. Um, it sets all that stuff away as the body becomes immobilized, the extra thoughts in the mind that that tend to block us kind of go out of the way a little bit. And if I can imagine myself vividly doing it, even if and, and if I can imagine myself vividly doing it while I'm in that theta state, um, even if it's contrary to my belief system, it's being impressed on the subconscious mind anyway, because those beliefs aren't able, I'm not giving them any attention. So they will start to wilt and die from lack of, of nurturing and lack of nutrition as I feed the ideal that I want to realize. I said a lot of things. I hope that made sense. No, that's, 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 that's eight minutes of Wim Hof, which is fantastic. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Dave. I mean, if, if I know we've, we've had the, we've had the first podcast with you, uh, as well but for people uh, hopefully they have gone back and listened to the first one and listened to this one as well but if people want to you know to follow you and find out more about what you do and and, and you know follow what you do uh, with your with your coaching with your you know everything you've got going on and your Wim Hof stuff what's the best uh, platform for people to do that on the best place to find out more about the coaching is to go to superhuman you coaching.com and there's a presentation on there that they can watch that that will guide them through um several of the points that i've talked about today in a little bit more detail um if they if you're in the u.s this only applies to people in the in the continental u.s and you want a copy of my book superhuman you which yeah i've got a copy of it sitting right here if you want a copy of this books superhuman you um i send those out for free i ask that the whoever is is getting it um, pay for shipping and handling, which is like 10 bucks. So you can go to superhumanubook.com if you're in the continental US and I'll send you a free copy of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, that book is an overview of of part of my path that I went on. Mm -hmm. um, it's it happened before. Um, before I did the training with Wim Hof mm -hmm. himself, I've been experimenting with it. But didn't feel qualified to speak on it in a, in a book at that point. So mm -hmm. superhuman you coaching superhuman you book.com um, are the two main places to go. Um, if you want to see like videos of me on stage and like see my, my performing strongman keynote speaker stuff, go to irontamer.com. And then on any and all social media platforms, if you look for iron tamer, uh, that's, that's me. Um, I say any and all there's some that I'm not on, like I'm not on Snapchat or anything like that, but uh uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. I'm Iron Tamer on all those things. Excellent. Um, Pete, do you have anything you'd like to uh, to say in, in conclusion or any, any final thoughts at all? Well, number one, I'm going to have to go and listen to this again. Um, <laughs> because there's loads in there. Honestly, I love, I love this stuff because it, it makes you think and it makes you want to, it makes you want to go away and, and work on yourself, which is really hard to do. Um, you know, and, 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 and there was one thing that you said earlier when... I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. Hang on to your thought. You just said you that it makes you want to do it, but it's really hard to do. Is that just a narrative that you're telling yourself? Well, yes. And I'm because about, I because, to, I'm because I literally just outlined how to make it easy. Yeah. No, I know. I know. <laughs> exactly. But it's... it's, it's it, yeah. I, it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now that I've completely disrupted you and called you out, please finish your thought. Yeah, but it's it's you know when when someone says so when someone says like that what, what I've just said, you know it's like yeah, but that's a thought that you that you're thinking all the bloody time. So just just change that, and then it'll change the process, and that's the thing, and that takes a little bit of time and a little bit of effort. But then mm -hmm. once you've done it, it becomes the normal, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. yeah, so there was there was that. Also, cold exposure, I don't necessarily do it, but I do live in a 250-year-old building where none of the windows and doors fit, and it's not that warm over here at the minute, so I kind of get it daily, <laughs> and I work outside. <laughs> and then um, the last one was the thing you said about um, people who jump into cold exposure. It made me think of Bud Jeffries again because there was a video of him I saw today of him lifting a trailer. He's got the trailer on his, like a, like a lorry trailer yeah. on his back and he's kind of doing he's, he's, he's doing calf raises or something he's like lifting it up uh, that, that's that, what it, that particular lift is called a back lift and it's it's set up in such a way that you're able to drive with the you have your back 
the entirety of your back flat against the platform. Yep. Um, old timers used to build various platforms to do it, but just thought it would be easier to, to use that trailer. And you have a, um, you drive with your legs, but you also have a, the apparatus set up so that you can push with your arms. So it's literally pushing with all four limbs against this ponderous weight. And the idea is just to break, break it off the, yeah. the support so that you can see daylight through. It. And that's what Bud's doing with that truck. But when you see it, for people go, who go and find this, when you said cold exposure, if you jump in and it's freezing and you're, you're like, yeah, yeah, come on, and that can kill you, that's kind of tantamount to just going and sticking yourself under one of these things and going, I'm going to lift that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, um, that's what came to my mind anyway. <laughs> uh, Paul, do you have anything you'd like to say to finish? Well, I think I've got two things, really. The first one is like, it's like my equivalent, I suppose, looking back on it, is an equivalent tribute to, to Bud. Yesterday, I was uh, I was just training, doing some max testers with one of my testing with one of my instructors, and because um, he's doing the Amazing Twelve uh, from next week, and um, yeah, one of my clients walks in saying this, her car's stuck in, into another car, and both the back wheel of one car was stuck into the front wheel of my client's car, and so me and my trainer had to go out and try and lift this car up in order to move it. Oh, my God modern cars are so heavy so bud is a machine i don't know how you know when i see people like bud doing things and making it look easy we had to get four people to try and even budget a couple of inches it was a mini as well but it was one of the right. modern <laughs> minis which is which is massively heavy you know so it's right. <laughs> not one of the old style ones uh you know the amount of power that guy had is crazy when you actually start to do these feats of strength mm. um and then the second one is i, I think um last two years it's been very easy to start. Um, it's taken its toll on a lot of people, and it's very easy to think of, um, to, to speak in negative ways, to have a lot of anxiety that carries with you in not only in, in, in social interactions because of COVID, but also into the stress it's put into work. And I think what's a pleasure talking to you, Dave, is that there's actually, there are people out there, for anyone listening who is going through a lot of stress and stuff, who can help you start building the structures around you and the mindset that will allow you to thrive because there's always a way of thriving. And often it's just about trying to, to, to work it out and find people. And sometimes it just takes finding someone who can articulate what success would look like and what that path would look like. You know, you can do it physically, but you can do it mentally as well. And I think it's always a pleasure talking to you Dave, because you are very uh, articulate around these really difficult concepts, very emotional concepts, very kind of intangibles. Um, and, th and that's why it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. Um, uh, the past couple of years have been uh, a trying couple of years for sure. You know, um, a lot of stuff that three years ago that is would be would have been completely unimaginable has happened and is old news now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but to that point, it's very very easy to get caught up in the current of complaining and being frustrated and worrying about things, but understanding that every moment that we spend complaining about something is a moment that we spend not being grateful for something else that's going on. You know, um, with, with a small child, um, every moment that, that you or I spend complaining about what's going on in the world is a moment that we're not wallowing in that that a two or three year old child can bring into our lives you know um and every moment that we spend worrying i've heard i've heard it put this way i don't remember where i heard this i did not come up with it. i wish that i had come up with this because i think it's absolutely brilliant in its elegance and its power is that worrying about something is literally praying for something that you do not want mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so every moment that we spend worrying about what might happen in the future is a moment that we lose in constructing in our own mind what we do want to happen in the future. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's one as well that's uh, is it? Um, it was saying from somebody said I spent I spent most of my life worrying about things, most of which never happened. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you're just you're just <laughs> constantly worrying about the potential of something. What's going to go wrong next? What's going to you yeah. know? What's bad's yeah. going to happen? And most of the time, like we all know, 
uh, you know, you worry about things and, and the reality that actually comes out is, is nowhere near as bad as the thing you were worrying about in the first place. Yeah. That, go, that goes with that four agreements thing of don't make assumptions, because if you're worrying yeah. about something, you're making an assumption of something that'll, that's probably yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, truly, yeah, brilliant. truly. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't have any science to back this up again, um, but I'm of the opinion that we as a species gravitate toward negative thinking because that is what allowed us to evolve into our position on the planet. We, we were smart enough to know that if we go over there, we're going to get eaten. And if we go over there, we're going to fall off that cliff. And, and um, so from a very primitive standpoint we evolved our consciousness to be very aware of danger to avoid danger to propagate the species but if we fast forward to now very few humans on the planet are ever actually in tremendous physical danger from something that's happening externally i mean i know that there's there's bad neighborhoods and then there's you know like situations um of of unrest and civil unrest in various countries all over the world and that you know everyone has their their moment of that but by and large most of us are never in any real danger mm. so our like program deep into our dna is this this hyper vigilance of what's going to try to kill me in the next two minutes mm. <laughs> and if we don't have an actual threat we will create one and mm. it, it winds up being you know somebody said something mean about someone on the internet and i think they were talking about me so i'm going to get bent out of shape about it and let it ruin the rest of my day you literally just let someone else on the internet that you may have never even met in person control your mind if you did that mm -hmm. and you have sovereign control over your mind and you can either hand that off to someone else or you can hang on to it for yourself so every time and and i'm not infallible i'm human i'm not perfect I experience these things on a day-to-day -day basis, just like everyone else. Something pops up in my feed. It rubs me the wrong way. I, and I'm going to go comment and tell this guy, but like how many times has anyone ever said, you know what, I'm going to completely change my belief system and my position politically, religiously, about food, about exercise, because this one person on the internet commented on my stuff that I was wrong. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> it's a futile futile thing. It's literally trying to hold back the ocean with a broom. So just don't do it. Don't participate in that. And the more you do that, the, the more you find that your mental diet is improving, that your self-image is improving, your self-confidence improving, and by extension, your life is improving. So um, be kind to yourself. Dave, that is an absolutely brilliant uh, place to wrap up. That was a great, uh, a great kind of final thought there that I think uh, everyone can take away uh, something from. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming in and joining us again, Dave. Um, uh, so thank you very much guys for listening as always and uh, please do share like subscribe if you're listening on a platform that allows you to leave a review please do leave a review if you'd like to join the Facebook group just go onto Facebook searching groups health oddity and uh, and join there and we will see you in there remember to check out uh, Iron Tamer uh, on social media to check out superhuman you uh dot com or superhuman you nope. book.com coaching superhuman you coaching dot com superhuman you dot com is is parked somewhere and and ah, okay yeah superhuman you coaching dot com or superhuman you book dot com uh to get the book if you're in the US. Uh thank you so much uh Dave uh Iron Tamer and uh we will see you all again next week. Take care. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.